After each staff ride speaker finishes relaying the events of the Tarkio fire blow-up and shelter deployment day, staff ride participants have an opportunity to ask them lessons learned questions. You know, I think we had I ha had things in place. Uh, you know, even being in front of the fire and the setup like this, uh, I was comfortable with the tactics we were we were using. This is business as usual for for us, and and uh, and it's always a little chaotic, and you're always getting new stuff thrown at you, and sometimes it all happens really fast. But it's it's happened a few hundred times in my short career as a hot shot to me, and. Uh, so no big surprises at that point. I think we had a good rapport and a lot of good communication. I wish there was some way that, that I could convey that crew cohesion that, that I had with my crew. Every single person on my crew and myself knew what was fixing to happen here. And, uh, um, you know, having, having kind of brought in these other folks that were working with us into our little camaraderie thing, you know, I, I wish I could have conveyed that maybe a little better to, uh, to them, and to where we were all for sure on the same page with that, you know. Um, you know, we were all, we talk about 30 mile and uh, <clears throat> the fact that, uh, you know, even though we take care of ourselves, we don't just take care of ourselves, we look out for other people around us too. So we were trying to do that. But I think I could have gone a little further, maybe. I don't know. That's, that's my lesson on this one. Things were breaking down and not going as planned. And, and there were just a lot of little distractions that sort of seemed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there were distractions at every point. Nothing, nothing was going as originally planned. Mm -hmm. There was something in every plan that was a deviation from the original. This being your first physical location and assignment for the, for the, for the project, and your first real visual of it, I mean, you say you drove around, but you, you got in here, you had to perform tactics on this ground now. At any point, did it, you just kind of step back and say, or did anyone say, this is lining up not the right way? I mean, the topography, the, the canyon, the winds that you knew were going to come when the aversion broke. I mean, what was your gut feeling when you rolled through that, that gaping mouth down there into this and said, okay? I guess <clears throat> I had talked to some of the crews about what they were doing, and nobody really expressed a, a major concern like from previous days. So this being my first day, I've got three type one crews who came back in here and no one brought that to my attention. So I guess based on the fire weather forecast saying that the potential existed, but the crews saying that the previous fire weather that they saw wasn't quite as extreme as what was protected. It was like the potential existed and I knew it, but if the fire behavior hadn't been doing that and the crews were willing to come back in, I hadn't seen it. I guess I figured I needed to at least get a day out here and get a feel for right, it myself. Right. So my first, it wasn't like, it didn't look as black. It was a lot more green. The fire was under an inversion. So things didn't look really bad my first drive into the canyon. Matter right. of fact, you couldn't even see that gaping because the smoke <laughs> was down so low, you couldn't see anything okay. when I first drove in. So there's kind of a general comfort level yeah. that everyone was, was standing behind. And so you... And that the plan seemed like nobody made a major objection at camp at the morning briefing. Everyone was still in agreement that, that, that this is maybe not the best plan, but it's doable. And okay. we'll at least go to it until something triggers us to get out of there. But we need some trigger points and we set them up. And when, when we met certain criteria, when we realized we couldn't commit to what we had with the resources we had and the comfort zone started to break down and you could hear the tension and voices starting to break down, it was time to just disengage. It was reported at the station below us by Frank that uh, a branch director had showed up. Did you have any interaction with this branch director? I did. Um, he was a branch director, wasn't regularly a part of the team, but he was out here. He, he was assigned to this, this area. Um, he, 
he actually, I tried to get him to help me with some of the problems that I was having with some of the crews when we were having the refusal to engage and it wasn't quite a formal thing. And, and I was asking him, I said, do you want to deal with this? Why I kind of go back over here and he's like, well, that's kind of your responsibility. He said, this is what I would do if I was you, but I think you need to go back and talk to him. You're the division soup. It's not my job to be giving orders to your crews. So we had kind of a discussion about whose responsibility it was. And I was kind of trying to utilize him as a resource. He was here that could maybe help me so I could focus because I had several things going and I thought maybe if he could help me there but he kind of his direction to me was more one of mm -hmm. of this is your position you need to go back and you need to talk to him this is what I would do with you it was more of a counseling than an assistance Can you talk about um, maybe some of the lessons that you've learned from this or put on your hindsight glasses oh, and he, talk about what you could do what you would do differently mm -hmm. or one of the things that some people asked and and I guess it was something for me is is um, we sort of have the luxury to say you know in hindsight is that those are worth a life you know should we have should I have been more aggressive with my friend when I told him jump in the truck and come with me if you're one who believes in fate or destiny you can almost say that if I hadn't had that argument with Mike and who hadn't taken the time that we would have taken it'd be a really good chance that we would have met Phil and Jerry in a really bad place and it might have taken actually longer to turn them around or back up two vehicles that were coming down than it would have to have waited for that dozer. And again, in hindsight, that discussion really didn't take that much more time because by the time he was actually ready to roll was the point that Jerry finally got there and he was behind me. So that slowed us down. But the bottom line is if they weren't coming down, should I have been more aggressive? The next time, should I be more aggressive? There were scenarios that were going on over here that I could hear with um, Frank and the water handling specialist and I could hear Frank saying well I don't know if I feel comfortable with that well what if we do and every time Frank would sort of raise an objection on the radio you could hear him offer another s possible solution rather than just disengage which was sort of where Frank was heading to and I guess that that became one of the questions that I've been asking a lot of people and I'm not sure how everybody would because everybody here is not fire I know that and, and I don't know which people are in this group or which aren't but in all organizations, in all stru uh, structures, we always have that hierarchical type, I'm the boss, therefore do what I say. But as much as we can use that as, as a way to, to help control or manage pe people, there's always going to be somebody who's going to be a little more brazen, a little more gruff. Their personality is going to be a little bit more outgoing than yours. And what do we do with the people who you have the authority and the responsibility to tell to do something, but they confront you? How do we do that? We all, we're all going to run into that challenge. And that's what I had happen to me. And I guess the lesson I guess I've learned is that, that I was willing to tell certain people, you know, I could hear some other confrontations going on. I was willing to tell those people that they were sort of out of line. This is it. This is the cutting point you're going. I heard Frank tried to make it clear and it didn't seem like it was going. So I got on the radio and said, this is division A talking to resource B. You need to leave. Your, your new supervisor will be Guzman. I won't be able to get out. I've been cut off. You need to respond to him. And I made sure everybody knew it. And then when I got up there, I actually got engaged in one of those conflicts myself. So I don't know how I'll deal with it, but it's one of those things that when, when you're in those situations, I know that I'll be a little bit more aggressive. The other thing is that we look at this as, uh, you know, again, it, we have the luxury because no one was killed as what, what's a dozer worth and all that kind of stuff? Is it worth a life? Because you can get to say that because there were no lives lost here. Everybody would argue it's not worth a life. But that's because we'd be looking at it as an agency, looking at a, at a vehicle that's simply a replaceable thing. And it would be pretty hard to argue that from anybody's standpoint. But as a private contractor, that's his livelihood. And without that, he has no income and you destroy his life without it. So to him, he's got a little more of a vested interest in it. And I don't know that as an agency, we look at that. We say, oh, well, we would replace it, but how long would it take us to replace it? And in six months, would he lose his house and his bills go? I mean, he's got more of a vested interest than, than I do. So how am I going to, the next time I get in that situation, how am I going to convince that guy that it's worth leaving that piece of equipment behind? I, I don't know that yet, but I know that I need to be more aggressive in some of those situations. Why so, don't you go ahead, Frank, and talk about your lessons learned and things that you could have done differently now that you put some thought into it? Um, I think I would. It would have been nice, of course, to get here early in the morning, and uh, but you know that was out of my control. Um, 
someone asked me, well, did you engage the safety officers? Did you? And I said, no, I kind of didn't. And uh, I, did you have a face-to-face -face with, the, with the branch director? And I said, no, I didn't. And, but like I said, I was just hoping that it would get better. I was just kind of hoping that, you know, okay, everyone would, it would settle down, that he was feeling the pressure of, of trying to save the power lines. And so maybe he was trying to do a little more, you know, trying to press the team or, or things like that. So um, I'm not sure I would have, if I'd had to do it over again, I would actually drove down the drainage and went and picked him up. And because here I am telling them to get out and to drive all the way over there to go tell him face to face, you need to get out when he's a branch director. You know, I don't know if I would have done that. I think I could have engaged the safety guys a little more and say, okay, you know, how can you help us? How can we work as a team here? And, and I didn't do much of that. In previous days, was the branch director doing the same thing or did this just happen on this day? Yeah, we were all new here and, he, and I think he just rolled into the fire last, the night before. Oh. Um, I, I, and he was from Arizona and I think he just came in that night and they kind of said, oh, go out there, okay. I think. Because he wasn't part of the team. I mean, if it was a member of the team who I know pretty well, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Right. Frank, uh, in regards to the safety officers and the branch director, was there two safety officers? There were actually three. Three? There were two sitting in a rig here, and then there was one that was on that side. Were the two here in some form of collusion with the other one? In other words, were they developing their own sub-organization around you? I don't know. I mean, but he, I mean, they were sitting here. And, uh, you know, they were like, we're safety. And I said, you know, great. And, you know, but, I, but they weren't really tied in with this guy, and they weren't, really weren't engaging me either. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I mean, to be totally honest, I was kind of thinking of them as just two other people I had to get out. Right. And I wasn't really thinking of, okay, well, you know, how, how can you guys help me, you know, look at this maybe from a different set of but, eyes. But the other safety officer was really becoming, taking an active role. Yeah. Or along with the branch director. Right. So the, a, a, a sort of a sub-organization or a right. phantom organization was developing. Exactly, exactly. He, he pretty much, the branch and the safety guy, they pretty much took over those resources. And even though, and so I was trying to, you know, get in my, my opinions, you know, when the radio would clear. And I think they were listening to him mostly because he was telling them what they wanted to hear, that you could stay up there and, and, and still fight fire. <clears throat> You know, I mean, you go through all these classes and all these, you know, scenarios and you see all the, I mean, I have every, you know, Discovery Channel special on fire and, you know, have read every book and I, I mean, all those things. And, you know, I mean, this is just classic, you know, and I mean, I could just see the, the, the uh, investigation where they say, so you were a task force leader. Why did you tell them to leave? And. You know, and and so I was, you know, I was trying to go through that, but yeah, they were pretty much ignoring, you know, what what I was saying, and I think it was not so much aimed at me, just because I was telling them to leave when they were saying, I think we can still do so. Right. But you eventually prevailed mm -hmm. in that they they finally gave in when you gave right. them information that showed their yeah. efforts were futile. Right. So how many of these <coughs> folks that were engaged here were a part of the morning briefing? Oh, they were all there. Everybody. Yeah, they were all there. Um, you know, when thinking back, you know, someone asked me what else, if I would have, uh, I think if at that night briefing, if I could have looked and looked at the span of control or something, I mean, this would have been kind of brazen, I think, but if I'd have said, look, you guys, let's just make this another division, let me do it, and let Alan do his own thing, because it's going to get too confusing, but I wasn't sure, I, you know, I, on the map, I mean, it looks kind of small and kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, not much to it. So, you know, I didn't want to go around saying, well, give me my own division or I ain't going to do this. But looking back, if we would have done that, I mean, sometimes I think on a task force leader, unless you have that rapport, you know, I was telling them things and it was kind of like a suggestion where if you're a division and you say, you know, look, I'm responsible for everyone. It's time to get out. I'm telling you, leave. You know, I think it carries a little more weight. And, you know, I think that would have helped. Mm -hmm. Being a line officer and then being in the fire line organization, you know, I guess I'm just used to people falling into place. <laughs> I'm not used to telling people, okay, now what do you see your role here as, you know, as a branch director, you know, and what do you see me doing? I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm just not used to doing that. And so, it may, but I could have maybe at least got them on the side and say, okay, we're the two overhead here. What do you think?
my brother's an FMO in Colorado, and when I was telling him this, I saw him a couple of weeks ago, I was telling him this, it was funny, he just said, well, Frank, if you follow ICS, this, and I said, yeah, I know ICS, I'm just, <laughs> got that one covered, I just, it was just so funny, because just people, you know, in the far said, well, what do you mean, that's not supposed to happen, you know, da, 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 this is the way it is, <laughs> haven't you seen the tree, you know, yeah. and, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that input. So. Yeah, and um, I mean, how do you move up in the for fire organization? Mm -hmm. It's not by being timid. I mean, when I you're on a 20-person crew or on a, you know, or something, mm -hmm. I mean, you're like, oh, that kid, that kid works. Okay, we want them. Okay, they're, and so, I mean, we get in this organization, and it's not, it's not because, you know, you don't want to, you don't right. want to do rugged work, or you're not into it, or you're like, oh, you'd rather, you know, mm -hmm. sit down instead of work. And so, you know, our organization is geared to those people that are aggressive. And so, Very good point. you know, you get up to, mm -hmm. you know, my father-in-law was a type when I see and, and he taught the class. And I said, well, how, how does that go? And he said, how do you think it is? He says, here you have a fire organization that, you know, is driven, you know, is ego driven. Yeah. And he said, and then you got the people that want to be the leaders of that ego driven um, organization. And he said, and then we name the teams after them. You know, so here's the National Sit Report one with their yeah. their yeah. name behind it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's yeah. a you know it's it's, it, and so you don't do that by by being the person mm -hmm. that's like, eh, I'm not sure. I mean, you you mm -hmm. get to those positions because you're the one that says, yep, this is what we're going to do, and this is why it's going to work. And by most mm -hmm. of the time, being right. 